everybody to uh, ecosystem.ai meetup. We are hosting a two-part series discussing the constructs of time in order to explore the true value of creating real-time AI systems. We will be looking at time from conceptual perspectives of human understanding and translating that into machine terms. Real time is the only time. That's from the uh, little introduction from the heading that, that uh, we put up a meetup. Jess, like we've said in previous meetups, we try to start off on a philosophical point and then we're going to move a bit more, a bit more uh, practical. So today is the first in a real time series, first of two, and we're going to be talking about time from a philosophical standpoint. And over to Jess. Hello and welcome everyone. I've got a relatively provocative chat today, hoping to get more people as involved as we have previously. And we're going to be looking at why humans have no idea how time works. So we've broken this down into sections exploring sort of different philosophical constructs. So from the, the starting point, we'll be looking at the, the physical constructs of time. So what time really is, and this is from the scientific or generally the physics perspective. I mean, it's science, so it must be right. It's a good place to start at least, even though there is still no, a lot being proven. And then we'll move on to more of the psychological sort of cognitive perceptions of time. So why the physical reality of time is not necessarily always real. And it's generally because of human perceptions. And then still within that sort of human perception bracket, we'll be looking at the cultural influences of time. So how societal structures have certain relationships with time for various reasons. And then looking lastly at consciously abstract time. So focusing more on a sort of computational social science paradigm and uh, time series information in technology. So this will provide us with a view of why time is actually very important to look at in business. All right, so with the measurement of time scientifically, I, what is time? ultimately. So the definition of time in a lot of places, the continued sequence of existence and events that occurs in an apparently irreversible succession from the past through the present into the future. Now, physicists and other scientists have been in pursuit of defining time according to natural law-based principles generally. And Einstein and his theories of relativity have provided a lot of the base of what we understand and where a lot of these theories have sprung from. So his theory gave us a view that time is in fact the fourth dimension and that humans can measure this fourth dimension with clocks. There is also often a distinctive linearity to time in which, although we experience it as a, a passage, neither past nor future have any real relevance in our present existence in some ways. So the concepts of past and future remain embedded generally within the minds of humans because we're the only ones that can fathom that. So an example of this is while we can make decisions that affect our future, we cannot necessarily make decisions that affect our past as time passes and we experience that passing only in the now because now is all that really exists or is it <laughs> so how we understand time or at least one of the most accepted concepts of time comes from a man named ludwig boltzmann who defined time in direct relation to entropy so in this way, time is condensed down to little more than just the passage of decay. And because of the very human ability to identify change, we can identify movement through time by experiencing certain aspects of existence ultimately fall into chaos. So for those that don't know, just a quick brief overview, entropy is a measure of how disorderly things are. So basically, when something begins fresh, it has low entropy or more order. And as time passes around it, or at least sometimes through it, entropy increases and it falls into chaos. So everyone knows that there's that one person 
who seems to just be in a constant state of a rapid increase in, in entropy. So their rooms will just turn into absolute chaos before it's reorganized and the process then starts all over again. Now, there are some fascinating theories of which time is being explored by physicists, and a lot of them stick to the mathematical measurements, so what we've derived from Einstein and his theories and a few others. But there are some, like, for example, just Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which in fact described the universe without any reference to time at all. Now, these kind of then bar the question, or at least offer up the question, you know, could it not then stand to reason that time is not really time at all? that it doesn't necessarily exist at all. So at least to humans, it is little more than the observation of decay of the physical existence of entities in yeah, entropy. So physics gives us the most accurate measures of time. With atomic clocks, it is possible to have the most precise readings of seconds in the world. This graphic on the screen at the moment is in fact a short clip from the Colorado University, sorry, from Colorado, yeah, the University of Colorado in Boulder that has now made the world's most precise clock. Yeah, and it's, anyway, so <laughs> physics gives us this most accurate measure of time. But even with these accurate, extremely accurate measures of time, what does this really mean to a human? So having an extremely accurate clock could perhaps just merely serve to give us less of an excuse to be a minute or two late for a meeting or to not arrive at the birthday party on time or, you know, to perhaps just keep a more accurate record of past events. And is this why time really matters? So was it, is it that something, sorry, that time means something to humans because we in fact experience it in the form of identifying change within our mind's eye? Now, the movement forward through the passage of time in which humans watch entropy in motion is just moving in place in an endless tunnel as time passes by, collecting memories of past events, imagining future ones, and yet only ever experiencing current events. So that is how science tells us that time exists. So that the present is a clear picture and the past is a fuzzy one and the future is this imaginary one, that seems to be more of a human construct or understanding. So while physics can give us some level of understanding the real dynamics of change, I mean of time, it doesn't really change our perception because the passage of human existence is ultimately subjective. Now, this subjective relationship with time allows some humans to experience sometimes the past more vividly than they, they would their present and envision a future that manifests itself due to active decisions made on the part of the human. So you can, in a few ways or in a lot of ways, ultimately control your future. So is it then that time is just an illusion? in which a human hallucinates a series of passing events because from entropy, things change and change provides us with a picture of passing time. Now, the block universe, which comes from Einstein's theory of the four dimensional reality, as I mentioned earlier, places the present in an ultimately static place, as though the present is a ball that's rolling down an eternal hill. And it's because the present is neither gone nor coming. So in this universe, the human perception of time is purely illusionary because Physics states that past, present, and future, namely that hill, are all happening simultaneously. Now, for a human, this concept is, is virtually unfathomable. I mean, yeah. So humans perceive time as that passage through existence. So as I mentioned before, from one event into another, consuming and collecting. And at the moment of consumption of that event is when that event is the most real. It then becomes attached and, and continues to exist in this fuzzy format. Now, we're kind of like that old Nokia game, for those that remember Snake, where every pixel of the snake gets attached to the snake's tail 
until ultimately it's too long not to bump into itself and die. It's a bit of a morbid <laughs> comparison, but in this sense, um, the only way we really know that time has passed is ultimately because the snake has grown. So when it comes to the psychology of time, it's probably more accurate to describe it as exploring the various mental processes that humans become aware of time. So in the sense, it's not necessarily that humans perceive time, but rather that they perceive the changes that happen over time. And a good example of this is experiencing the changes within our bodies as we age. So we don't necessarily experience aging, we experience the effects of aging and to relate it to the scientific element of it, just to watch our bodies fall into entropy. Now, with regards to perceived temporal experience, uh, the psychologist and neuroscientist Ernst Poppel has outlined a number of what he calls elementary time experiences in a human's perception of time. So they range from a duration and non-simultaneity, order, past, present, and of course, change, which includes that passage of time. So I won't be going into the fundamentals of each, it's definitely not enough time, although I'd love to, but rather just to note that the temporal experience of time is often inextricably linked to tense, so past, present, future. However, the question of the order in which those experiences are had is often called into question. So consider for a moment whether you've ever had the chance to experience or re-experience, if you will, something that you've forgotten about. Like when somebody or something has reminded you of an event that you were no longer thinking of. So it could be said that you in fact experience this past event in your present, ultimately living it for the first time rather than reliving it after the time you've forgotten it. Just wrap your heads around that one. I love that. So the one remaining constant with all experience of time is that it will only ever happen in the now because the present is the only true reality, right? Mm. So let's consider for a moment the concept of which comes from this temporal experience. It's called the specious present. So it's a psychological theory that was characterized by a man named William James in 1890 under his principles of psychology. And it refers to the mental measurement of the present, of now. So the specious present can actually last anywhere between a non-zero and a short term. So depending on the circumstances in which that human is experiencing this present. So this theory was focused on establishing ultimately the length of now. So perception of motion is often used to illustrate this concept. I like this GIF on the screen that you guys can see. Humans perceive motion instead of static moments. So it's the same as movies or GIFs or anything else. It's actually just a series of still images that are played in succession, which are then seen as movement. Now, it is this motion that allows humans to experience this passage of time, to experience this change as something that's fluid rather than just to event. And these are often, at least the conception of emotion is based on the difference between the placements of something that was and then something that is. Again, to reference that aging thing, your hands were less wrinkly at some point and then they become more. And you only really know that they're more because you remember at a time when they weren't. But of course, as the concept of the specious present states, this passing of time can sort of vary in length when it comes to the present. So the variance in length is ultimately the distance between the content of consciousness and the act of consciousness. So the more aware you are of time passing, the slower that present time space will be, which is why what often happens when we are in a queue or eager to get going, time seems to slow down. And it's because the act of consciousness is very much placed on that time. And the content of the consciousness is not what is the word, visceral enough for us to be paying more attention to that content. So, yes? Can I check with you? So I think that 
I mean, that's the thing in computational social science is that if you had to think of asking humans, you know, to, so when you run into somebody, ask him when last did they put in fuel in their vehicle and what was the time that it took them to do it? And then please tell me the last five times that you've done it and give me the exact date and time. And then trying to figure out, you know, if they've been to say a restaurant on their way, you know, or whatever the actions were that they performed in that time frame. And it's almost like like history just becomes this blur that that confuses the things that you do right now. So the more you are in a moment and the more you don't remember. So that's why it's very different than if you have a data point telling you who what the people are doing than than if they just had to be asked what they're thinking about that moment. Yeah, definitely. And it's very much like that example that I posed just now with the snake. We collect these events and, and the more times that we do something, like for example, putting fuel in, the less likely you are to separate the memory of what those events are. Unless, of course, there's something that is particularly striking that's helped you to remember that present that then becomes something that you focus on in past. So yes, yeah, so if you do get stuck in that present moment, it can last yeah, any distance of time. But so there's also something called perceived temporal length, which is about the ways in which time can vary based on your well emotional relationship with this present event. So like I mentioned just now, where an hour can feel like three because you're waiting. And so the contents of your consciousness are experiencing the present and ultimately getting lost within that present, not necessarily grasping um, something to hold on to or something that could be like Jay said, the data point in this sense would be a lot more a lot more accurate. Now there's another example of temporal experience which I'm keen to just touch on here because I think that it's something that a lot of people have experienced and it's kind of cool to think about it. And that it's that the present never actually exists, or at least the present that we understand never exists. Because when an event happens, the time that it takes for us to see and absorb that event, to process it and to understand it, we are then understanding something that has happened in the past. Again, not necessarily relevant here, but I'm digressing a little bit, but it's something that I find is really quite fascinating. Okay, so back to temporal length. It stands to reason, according to this concept, that in order to increase like participation, um, the event must bear some sort of enjoyment or significance to the human, lest they get bored and wander off. Somebody asked me what is time, then I'm like, it's half past four on Wednesday. <laughs> and I see the way that I'm explaining it. Scientific time, but. In answer, so, Jess, the way I'm doing it with the kids, this maybe to answer that because the way we do it, the kids ask me, so how long will it take us to get there? And I say about this long. <laughs> so the thing is that if, if if we translate time into into physical distance, at least we can then confuse them sufficiently so that next time we say, how long is it going to take us to get there? It's going to take this long. They should be able to figure out that it's a fraction. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just there. <laughs> oh, I think by the way, the other reason that children experience time so much more differently than we do is they're processing a lot more information and their benchmarks are much bigger in their minds. So as you're growing up, you know, it's the first time you walked or rode a skateboard or uh, went to school or the first grade, second grade, there's all huge benchmarks in their minds. And they're also processing so much information The time actually moves slower for them. Yeah. Versus us, our days are kind of, they all just kind of blur together. They're all kind of rote. So they happen much faster for us than they do for children. And again, yeah, that's linked again to that concept of well, the sameness really that that makes the time sort of speed up. Is if the events have happened and happened before, you don't necessarily absorb as much of it as you would when it's happening for the first time. Jace, there's a hand. Hi guys, how are you guys doing? Good and you? So just, I just want to take a stab in the dark in terms of this, you know, perspective of children. Is it also not the fact that? You know, these children are still, they're still quite pure in the way they think. They don't, they're not controlled by, you know, society just yet. You know, as you grow older, you've got more problems, more things to think about, whereas kids live in the moment as much as possible. So for them, time actually doesn't really exist, you know, as a social con social construct, if I were to word it that way. So yeah, for them, it's, it's always just being in the moment. 
Yeah, I'm going to show an example later just around how we see time compacting over time. Because what happens though is that maybe to play between what Peter was saying and where you explained it, the way we're looking at least, is that if you are in your you know, early years, your brain development and how you perceive everything around you is very different because it's very much tied within your immediate environment. So what will happen is that bigger and big activities normally are seen as novel. So, so as soon as something's seen as really novel, your memory of it and, and your experience of recalling it is very different than if you've done something ritualistically, you know, a hundred times over. So the challenge is that as you, when you're younger, you know, and you lived for one day and, you know, re reflect on this, on the second day, what happened the first day, you've lived half your life. By the time you get to, to 10, it, it gets narrower. And by the time you get to 80 or 70 or 60, whatever the age might be, your new experiences on a day by day, day by day basis are so compacted that you don't really have many novel things happening to you unless you deliberately go look for novel things. Mm -hmm. So, so that means that your perception of time shifts radically through your lifetime, we found. And, it, and it's evidence in the data mm -hmm. around how and why people get involved in certain activities, like, like human learning fundamentally is time bound. So when you're young and you learn and you put your hand on the stove and you burn and you might do it a second time and you might do it, a th but, you, but then there's a point where you kind of exclude certain activities almost entirely from your life to avoid the pain. So, mm -hmm. so, so we can clearly see that that spectrum of activity narrows radically as you grow older. And there's, there's some maps that normally show how that happens and our companies map their products onto that evolving time plus in the activities that you perform as time evolves. Yeah. I think also, and yeah, in a lot of ways, the, the sort of scientific boundaries that are created by this measurement of time, which is not necessarily something that humans do naturally, animals often do, but humans seem to be rather bad at that. We need external things to gauge how to track time, which Daniel will probably go into a little bit more detail about when you think about the cultural teachings and the different ways, or at least how they teach the different ways that you can perceive time. So these sociological or cultural influences determine how we watch these external entities and, and gauge our time from there. So Daniel, if I can hand over to you. Okay, so hello. What I want to kind of start out with is I just want to mention that time is, or at least our perception of time, is very culturally influenced. It's very amorphous and kind of abstract. And I kind of want to first start talking about what types of time there is. And it's probably fair to say that all of us here, or at least most of us, have a linear perception of time that we believe that events take place sequentially and that the, the future is ahead of us, and that the past is behind us. But there are other types of time. There's cyclical, which is listed here, and there's also, like, reverse time and, like, spatially oriented perceptions of time. But we're not going to really touch on those because they're too complicated, and we don't really have the time for that as well. But I'm going to first... I want to talk about how cyclical and linear time are both cultural and those perceptions of time are influenced by how we live our lives. The ancient Egyptians had a cyclical perception of time. And this is due to, if I were to say, two things. The first is the routine flooding of the Nile River, which was their main source of sustenance and livelihood. If the Nile River were to flood, and it did flood, at the same time every single year, that would reinforce or at least create an idea of cyclical time, especially if you don't have something like a watch telling you exactly what time it is. And another thing that would probably reinforce this idea of cyclical time is that ancient Egypt lasted for a super long time. I mean, it lasted for, I think, over 3,000 years. It's If you were living in ancient Egypt and you had like the lifespan of 60-something years, and that's, I think, stretching it, it would be fair to assume that time is cyclical because the land that you're living on has been like that since before you were born and chances are it's going to be like that after you die as well. Whereas in the United States and in Europe, but I'm going to be talking about the United States mostly, we have a linear perception of time and for two similar reasons to ancient Egypt's reasons why they had a cyclical perception of time. In America, time is measured outside of 
the number on our phone telling us the time. It's measured by development. And this is historically too. The US has always had this idea of expansion and building. If you've lived in a city for 20 years, chances are within those 20 years, you'll have seen buildings built. And that's one way of perceiving time. And it's harder to tear down buildings, at least in a legal way, (laughs) than it is to build buildings. And that impacts our perception of linear time. Additionally, in America, time is literally money in that the vast majority of people in the United States earn money by the hour. So in theory, the more time that you spend working in America, the more money that you will make. And that should make, and this isn't necessarily true, this is theoretical, it should make, like, the more time you spend, the more wealth you will accrue. And that impacts a linear perception of time. But even then, linear time can have a huge amount of variance within it. For example, the calendar is really good example of how linear time can differ. We all probably adopt the Gregorian calendar with our 12 12 months and around 30 days each month. But what I mainly want to talk about is that in the Gregorian calendar, our days roll over at midnight. When it hits midnight on Monday, it becomes Tuesday. When it hits midnight on Tuesday, it becomes Wednesday. And each day is exactly 24 hours long. But In the Hebrew calendar, that isn't necessarily the case. And in Judaism, there is also a conception of linear time. But in in the Hebrew calendar, days, instead of starting at midnight, they start at sundown. So the days go from sundown to sundown. And what that means is that depending on the season and depending on where you are, a day isn't necessarily going to be 24 hours long. There's going to be variance in how long a day is, because sometimes the sun will set earlier than on other days. And that creates a linear perception of time, which is slightly more flexible and less fixed, because each day is not exactly the same when it comes to length. And building off of that, if you live super far up north, and some of you might, I don't know, During the winter or the summer, the amount of daylight you get varies super drastically, especially if you're really close to uh, the North Pole, in that sometimes during the winter, in fact, most of the time during the winter, you're not going to have sunlight. You might have it for an hour a day at best. And in the summer, the opposite applies, where most of the day, except for maybe an hour, is going to be as if it were noon. And if you didn't have a watch, if you had no way to actually measure time except for maybe the positioning of the sun or the moon in the sky that's going to impact your linear perception of time a personal anecdote is that when i would visit stockholm in sweden when i was a kid i would not fall asleep until something like 11 30 when it started to get dark and that's a pretty big difference for a kid who'd normally fall asleep at eight and i didn't use a watch either um so that was that impacted my perception of linear time. And this also applies to something I think we all experience, unless you're in, I think, Arizona or something, which is daylight saving time, in that all of a sudden, time switches to be an hour later or an hour earlier. And if we were to look at this from a timeless lens, without this construct of time, we would be like, why the hell are we doing things an hour earlier or an hour later all of a sudden? This is how it is. It's how time works. And that impacts our linear perception of time, is being told that time moves depending on the time of year. And one more thing that it can impact our linear perception of time is socialization. You may have a friend who is always late to everything, or you may have a friend who sometimes likes to overstay their welcome when they're over. And that's likely because that friend prioritizes socialization over deadlines, which in, I think, many people in the linear, I should probably specify, like, European-American linear perception of time believe in sharp deadlines. Like, if you're going to do something at 7 p.m., you're going to show up 
within five minutes of 7 p.m. It's pretty standard. But some people might show up maybe 20 or 30 minutes later because they believe that ending a conversation naturally is more important than cutting off a conversation early to go attend something. And that creates a linear perception of time that, which is a bit like the uh, the Hebrew calendar, is a bit superfluous and abstract and is ever-changing. And basically the point I'm saying by bringing up all of these examples is that linear time can change drastically depending on cultural context and religious and geographic context, which I would argue are all elements of culture, which is a bit redundant. But <laughs> now I'm going to hand it over to Jay, if that's all right with you. Oh, wait, we have a question. So there's just a few things I would like to just... So culturally, there's these writings where you write each culture. For instance, power distance, that is like... And then there's also collectivism versus individualism. And then there's also long-term orientation versus short-term orientation. So China is sort of like long-term orientation, and then Western is uh, short-term orientation. And then the other thing is, what are, depending on your language, the amount of keywords you use and the tenses, that impacts the culture's perception of time. So if mm -hmm. they've got a lot of words containing, let's say, past or future tenses, they will look at their watch a lot and they will say, where were you, and things like that. And cultures that don't have a past tense, they don't tend to ask where were you and stuff like that? So yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. A big impact, a good absolutely. Point, yeah. yeah, I think that, but that's the thing, though, isn't it? Is that if we know that time varies like that, what do we then do with time-related data, and how do we interpret that? So yeah, thanks, Daniel. Jess, that was really great. So what I want to do is um, trying to find a, a very hands-on, practical angle. If you guys are okay with it, and I think that. At the end of it, we probably will be discussing some of the things that you've seen before, but I'm going to go through it kind of fairly quickly just to give you a glimpse of how we see this. So maybe just, just go to the next one for me. So if you had to think of, you know, the concept of music just by, by metaphor, it is the one thing that you can't, that you can't trap in time. You know, you can't just say to somebody, I'm going to give you, you know, a kilogram of music or a pound of music, um, and here it is. You know, you can, you can only really truly understand it or, or enjoy it if there's you know rhythm and beat and there's something that that is novel in the variation that happens in a particular time moment and it only really makes sense if it is highly organized by having kind of rhythmic cycles and that, it, and that it's organized in a way that 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 create a pleasant feeling you know for the person who's who's listening to it in the, the way that you would see it you know maybe in your own mind's eye if you had to visualize it or the way that you would hear it it becomes kind of a completely experiential while time runs so that means that if you had to think of the concept of music in relation to business is that if you had to just start assessing the companies around you and how many businesses are fundamentally involved in something that can only be experienced while time is executing you will see that that telecommunication services and banking services and media companies and most of those organizations fundamentally only provide something valuable you know while time runs and then you have on the other side organizations like you know motor car companies or if you're going to buy you know a physical computer or a tablet you know that that it is entirely devoid of time you know you don't know when it was made, how it was made. So it's got a different property and how you and how you look at it. So so human aging is as maybe just one way of, of looking at kind of time stretches by concept. So if you had to think of music, you know, if you had to listen to a song that's gonna carry on for say a year, or well, let's make it shorter. Let's say you're gonna listen to a song that lasts for, you know, one day. Maybe if, if from the seventies you can listen to some rock solos that might last for an hour or two. I mean, that would have been exciting, isn't it? In the modern world, they don't do that anymore. Now we're trying to find the shortest possible time to get the maximum amount of variation. So that means get the novelty as, out there as quickly as possible so we can move on to the next one because we now get this abundance of supply. But there are things like, like you know, how the human engages with its environment that is changing at a certain pace. You're not going to, you're not going to make it faster or slow it down. So in this kind of conceptual map, you're just trying to see well the relationship of a human's age in relation to say animals or a dog in the home 
And you know that this arbitrary formula as to how we normally would calculate, you know, divide a human's age by a certain number, but the relationship is not is not linear. So that means that, you know, by concept, what happens as we age as humans and everything around us start changing, every single element of interactions, life cycle of change is different to our own. So that means that if you're an adult and you've got a child and you live in a certain home, you drive a certain car, you know, you engage, you know, with people at the restaurant at the road, whatever that might be, that means that the, the, the time that restaurant is going to be in business, the amount of time that you're going to have your motor vehicle, the, your life in relation to your, so that means that this fragmented view and the complexity of the relationships of different trajectories of time creates a, a dynamic com complex environment. So that means it's very difficult for anybody to form a generic theory of how are they going to be using time to analyze anything because you've got these very sporadic ways in which you know time really in, in, intersects with each other or the different types of time. Now, by means of example, if you had to look at you know how money gets used over a person's lifetime, you know when you are young, you know and you engage with and let's look at this as kind of a really practical example. You know you open up your first bank account and you get your first phone number from a telco provider and you are pretty excited about that because well, because it's all novel, it's pretty exciting and you probably don't have that much money in there. So that means that you first have to go and buy a wallet with the cash that you have. So you then you don't have any money in the bank. So even if you've got the card, you can't use it. <laughs> but, but that means that your whole, you know, basically the way that you perceive that whole experience that was designed by the company really needs to understand that life situation. So it needs to understand, you know, why and how and, and, and when you would enjoy what you see and, and what will be exciting to you. So if you are a if you are a kid and you get given this for those who have looked at their wallets lately or you still got a plastic credit card in there. And imagine giving a plastic credit card with a single color, even if it's black or it's gold, whatever might be important to you to a kid, they're gonna look at it and go, well, I mean that's not exciting at all. It means nothing to me because my point in my life where I fit I want to see maybe something like a Disney character on there. I want to see a skateboarder. And and by the way, it'll, I'll only be interested in this topic for the next you know year because next year I'm interested in something else. And the next year I'm interested in something else. And then by the time we get to, you know, in this example, you know, you have your first child. And by then, you know, you care less about what your credit card or your plastic and your wallet looks like. I mean, it's the last thing in the world you worry about. Now you only care about am I saving the money for this kit that I've got now to make sure they can, they can go to university one day. So that means that, that that shift in perception over time and the changing state that you go through is enormously important for companies to drive competitiveness. And we have just found that if you understand that and you make, you know, you know, really a concerted effort to truly figure out what these various stages are that people go through and then map the different styles of learnings on top of that that you've gain through time, you have a much better chance of understanding how time will influence will, will influence people. So, so the basis to look at it is like this, is that you, you want to think about time series, time related activity in, in, in a product sense. So that means that if you know that there's something physical that is being sold or being been engaged in or whatever it is that you're going to do that is of a physical nature, the social conditions are very different than if it's purely a service. Because if you think about it, if you know, buy your first motor car or you buy, you know, food at a restaurant, whatever it is, you know, there's something very physical and it's typically considered to be hyper local. So that means the human has to be present to, to enjoy that particular product that they've got that might be in existence for a certain period of time. So that means understanding the data points around how you would prove that the person was there, what they use it for, when they use it, will then tie you into the service thinking. And service dominant logic tells us that you have to understand the reasons why people got there in the first place. How much time did it take you to make a decision? Once you have made the decision, how much time did you spend with whatever it is that you have purchased? When did you stop using it? At what point did you decide to try other things that are as novel as what you've just bought? So that means that understanding the separation of the physical in the world of acquiring something that asset gets transferred to you that is hyper local in the physical world versus consuming things that are inconsumable require very different treatments in your time-related activity, especially if you're going to build recommendation systems to, to, to fit within something that, 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 that provides something useful for, for a customer. So to get theoretical just for a moment, this is a view 
that was created by Richard Norman, who is a, uh, a Swedish researcher that worked with companies like IKEA and you know a lot of really big businesses you know throughout you know throughout his life. And I think what was really great is that he took a social science view of time and overlaid it over how we see our everyday life and, and especially how we run you know kind of our businesses and our thinking. So to tie it back to what Jason Daniel was telling you into more like a framework is that. We, we have this concept called the current established men, uh, uh, mental map. And that established mental map essentially is the programming that was done on us from our childhood. So that means that as you travel through time, you have been programmed to believe certain things and to think about the world in a certain way. And all of your prejudices has come programmed. And, and that means that, that when you then reflect on it and you look back in time, you know, you see, you see history kind of maybe conceptually, but it's only when it's recorded do you see it objectively. So that means that when you said that something happened at a certain point in time, like I was born on a certain day, those are very discrete time events that you can say that, yes, there's evidence for it. But then there are other things. that if you had basically been through a situation where you liked school and then you didn't like school, or you like to work with somebody and you don't like to work with somebody, and you had to ask somebody to please give you the discrete dates when these events happened or at what point did you stop liking something at what point did you not want to go somewhere you find that things get incredibly fuzzy so it gets in completely conceptual so that's why we call it the conceptual past is that people find it difficult to reflect on that and i think this was really a major issue in in, in social science research if you had to focus on immersing yourself into a situation so you need to find evidence that will tell you that this is actually what happened. The person went through a series of changes. They drove a certain way or they traveled somewhere or they ate certain food. They communicated with certain people. And as a response of this complex mesh of activities, they then changed their buying behavior. And, and sometimes we like to believe, if you had to think of maybe professionals in marketing or those kind of disciplines, that it was the fact that somebody liked my product and they didn't. But most cases, there are many reasons that together form the evidence bits of how people would move through time. So the big part here is if you look at, you know, the archetypes of the collective unconscious, you know, if you live in the era that you're living in and you are really connected with the people around you, you will be deeply, in, you know, basically influenced by them. So if you, if you had to live during, you know, Germany in the 1940s or you had to live in, you know, maybe in Silicon Valley in, the, in, in 1995, or you had to just think of some events that maybe you all can relate to, is you get the whole collective around you almost forcing the belief systems, the thinking, and, and you get programmed to believe that that is how things should work. So when you then move into a future state of time, you still got all of that prejudice and all of that thinking embedded in how you, in, in, in how, in how you reason. So that means that you need to figure out how to upframe so upframing gives you an ability to use what's known as creative induction, to be able to have a creative view of the world that you now want to see differently, create a new future that's called, you know, an artifact scenario of what the future could be, project your life to get there, and then work your way back to see what is it I need to do today to change in my thinking that I must fix first before I move into a future state. So we just see that, that computational social science give us a mechanism to understand this non-conscious domain, to, to, to track the evidence of the belief system, of the thinking, of the ways in people buy, the way they engage, the way they show evidence of their existence because they don't do it deliberately. You, you cannot interview somebody ever and get that evidence from them because they just don't know. They don't remember. They don't reason about it that way, but they will leave shreds of evidence behind. Then the domain of the everyday discourse helps you to engage with them. So you know that if somebody is not fundamentally going to like a certain brand of car, a certain brand of, you know, of, of, of clothing, or, you know, they want to, you know, engage with a certain type of company, you know, you want to be able to see if there's something that is subconscious to their situation. That's a non-conscious main evidence that will help you to then to understand how you engage with them. And then this abstracted domain, the consciously abstracted domain, help us into design influencing systems, nudges and the like, that will get them to believe something new that will shift them from their old belief system. So you need to make sure that it's sufficiently nostalgic to create a hook, but it needs to be also new that it's novel. And that way you then move people through time. If you make it too far, you create a cognitive jump that is just too large and people cannot make that leap. They just won't engage. 
So you need to figure out how you move them through time. And this helps us to understand, you know, how that how that actually happens. So so now the thing is that this is one of the ways that you can look at it. It's also one of one of Norman's models that I think that for me had a huge impact on how you know you kind of need to see the world, maybe even if you have to think of it in that kind of in that kind of way that you know, if you know, at a certain point, you know, you reflect on what's possible in the future and you say, well, yes, I'm going to go and try out new things. You say, you have to ask the question, well, you know, or where am I? And the only way that you're going to know that you truly achieve the things that you should be achieving is that you have to ask the question, you know, what could I be? I mean, where could I be? And what is it that I could do, not will do or must do or goal driven, achieve only that. So the concept here is to say that if you open up your reasoning and your thinking, and you expand your mindset. You want to make sure that you attempt many options. You want to try multiple things before you then decide, yes, now that I've tried many options, I will pick a few and I will then get to the outcome. And that will then get me to a place as to what I should be. So that means I can go from where I could be to where I should be. But if that line is linear and singular, then normally what you would find people then end up with being not happy, like we discussed in some of our happiness just before. But that just means that if you want to take somebody down a route of taking them to a point where that's a better place, the idea is that you need to give them options. And you want to give them options reliably through recommenders and through, in our case, we've got technology that will help you to figure out where people could be. You want to figure out what those options are. And the more you test the options, the more you will see that they will converge on the things that they really will like or maybe they, they should like, they believe they should like in every single discipline of their life because you have this ability to keep on testing the boundaries of where people see their see their own lives anyway so the last part of this you know is, is probably more you know a repeat of what jason have done this is just the actual definition of how psychology sees time and the fact that it's you know the fact that we reflect on something in a chronological order and the like and if you're looking in social science what is great about social science is that we're not you know, we're not tied to any one definition. You know, we, we kind of use whatever is useful to us to solve a problem and to make sure we get to an answer is what we are is what we are interested in. We don't believe that time is just one, one finite, finite concept. And that this means in that computational social science means that we've got subfields of study that help us understand how things work. So that means that if you had to take social network analysis or organizational network analysis, looking at changes in a business over time or look at collective behavior of change over time or look at you know how knowledge is acquired over time or look at cultural shifts over time so for us time is the essence of all of this work because you truly understand the shifts and the impact of decisions and of products and of brands and whatever it is over time by understanding all of these elements and you want to bring all of that together in a kind of more safe computational way and that means that the data science world sees it more mechanically. It seems that it sees it as what's known as time series data. But for us, it's far more than just a time series data set. You know what I mean, so that means a social collective view of how time has changed relationships over time and so on is not always just seen as a dynamic movable network. It's not time series. So that means we need to expand our definition of how we see all the time time related time related data points. So the last few slides you guys have all seen before, you know, so so that means bringing together psychology and social science, computational social science, data science, bring all of these together, you know, is really quite crucial for you to understand truly how you're going to build anything that can capture the fact that humans shift, you know, their behaviors over time. And that means that you want to understand the structural definition of what happens to them. You want to know how the, once they've engaged, how the way in which they've engaged have changed their world structurally. So that means that at some point a human would have at a point in time, live in a certain home, work in a certain job, drive a certain car, eat certain kind of food. And for a period of time, that will be true. So you want to understand the structural relationships between those elements. But what you also want to understand is how the time changes over time. So that means that you want to know that how do they engage with the environment around them? And that show evidence of the kind of personality that they are. So you can see that if somebody is really interested in, in novel things. They will be more experiential. They will go try out different options. They'll click more, they search more. They, but if somebody is, is just interested in, in, in taking a certain action, it means that they'll be very specific around the time of the day, what they purchase, when they exit, where they move on, you'll see evidence of them taking those kind of decisions. And that means that what you want to figure out eventually 
is how you then build an automated personality tracker. So in our case, this sits in our engine. So we've been working on that from a technology point of view. Doesn't mean it's the only theory of how things should work, but you wanna have time as one of your measures to figure out when somebody engages with say a digital app and they, and they spend an hour to click on one item, it might mean that they're completely distracted. But if somebody is talking to somebody on a phone and they're having a conversation and they keep quiet for a minute after every time that there's a conversation, you know that there's something wrong or, it's, or maybe you're not explaining or there's seconds of, of wait. And then if somebody keeps on inter interrupting, say a call center agent and talking and very excited about something or they're very upset, you'll be able to quickly figure out what you need to do because you can track that time differences that are normally like Daniel was saying, culturally embedded, and you need to figure out how your algorithm then needs to calibrate to that personality within that particular situation that you that you're trying that you're trying to solve. And then, I mean, yeah, the last item is just you know what we call reframing your ability to kind of take all of this thinking that we talked about, put yourself in the future. If you apply some of this and you get benefit from this, would you will be better than if you don't have it there? I mean, I think that's really just kind of maybe the final point from here. So uh, JCL, I think that's all for me for now. I think that's... Cool, thank you very much. I actually wanted to note something. We had a comment in the chat from Sanka who said, linked us uh, some interesting thoughts by a person called Alan Watts, who basically <laughs> introduced Buddhism cool, to man. the position. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna play a video earlier of, of Alan yeah. Watts. We, we didn't have time. I mean, I love his, uh, the conception of time. Yeah, Yeah, uh, I was gonna say, we're all very interested. Alan Watts is, is very much embedded in, in a lot of what we, when we do these explorations. Because he, he definitely theorizes a lot of these things. That particular video is also, it's a really good one to watch. It's quite long, but it's well worth it. Absolutely. Alan Watts developed, you know, in his early, you know, if you look at his early work, when he just, just joined Berkeley and then later on how he developed, you know, the theory definitely matured quite a bit. But, but I think the whole thing, my, one of my favorite explanations is that when he describes, you know, kind of how people take a journey through life and he says that we are entirely wrong in, in in equating you know our life with with a journey because he said that it's never about the journey and the destination he said you should look at you should look at life like a like like a dance and he said that when you dance around a room there is no destination you know the journey the entire experience is just the fact that you are that you are immersed in in the pleasure of spinning around and doing what you're doing and that means that even if you don't get to an outcome, you know, it doesn't mean that it's meaningless. <laughs> and that means that sometimes what time does for, to us is that we become obsessed with achieving certain things at a certain point in time. And in most cases we have to, because I think that financially and for us to live our lives, we have to do that, you know, but you don't have to do it with all of your life. There's some parts of your life that, you know, and I think what, I mean, Daniel just also, also talking about when you're in Spain, and maybe that was just my experience with, some people are doing work with in Madrid is that people were late for meetings all the time. And there was no way you can get upset because if you're in Spain and you had a conversation with somebody and it was really meaningful, there's no way you're going to cut somebody off. You're not going to say to them, sorry, I'm stopping now. You say, well, the next person will understand <laughs> that I've finished this conversation and it's done and I'm going to then come to you when I'm finished. So, so I think that, yeah, it, it does create, you know, different pressure points, but what, what's at least give a nice background view of that? I like it. Yeah, I think time has also become, I mean, like I mentioned earlier as well, there's this sort of dissonance between these event notations that we've attached to time. So like Jay was saying, you know, when a meeting is supposed to start, that's when it's supposed to start. But then you do, a lot of our society is built um, off of that. I say our society, I'm assuming that majority of us here will share the similar kind of society where you are expected to turn up at a certain time. And if you arrive late for a family <laughs> gathering or something, which I sometimes do, you get, you know, really into a lot of trouble for something like that. <laughs> no, you don't get into trouble. Do you get in trouble for your family <laughs> gathering late meetings? No? course because I'm always late you know but then if you think about it you almost lose out on the the value of the experience of the thing that you were engaging in because you're constantly chasing those new destinations those new checkpoints those new boundaries and this is also why I often question 
I mean, the value really of trying to figure out the world's most accurate time. When I was doing a lot of this, my whole thing was like, okay, cool. So we have the world's most accurate time. I mean, what does that really mean for us as humans? Like, what does that mean for you guys? Is it just something that's interesting because we can trace back the origins of, of the earth? And I no, mean, I think and there's something... I Alan, what? I, I, th I think it's more accurate GPS. That's basically the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's more accurate the fact that I can check the logs in my computer system at nanosecond level or something. So that if the clock can if the clock can measure you know fine grained numbers, you know then. But but I think but Jess, I think the the point really isn't it is that there's that there's a social conception of time. There's the psychological internalization of time of people individually, and then there's the computing that that enables that. That, that is sometimes educates a society as to what they need to do about time. That means that you got, I mean, if you have a sports watch that will track your running time, not to the minute or anywhere, you can now, from the moment you, you put the leg forward, you know, a nanosecond to a nanosecond accuracy will measure how far you've run, you know, what your heartbeats were, everything that's happened to you along the way, how many times you've listened to music. I mean, so that means we've got a finite measures of everything in our lives because technology has enabled us to do that. So you're going to probably get some people over time that's going to be more resentful of that. I'm kind of seeing because there's more people who say, well, I don't want to be part of this thing because why is it doing all of this to me? And then you're going to get the, the personalities that naturally want to experience all of this. who are just going to get more and more engrossed until they're completely hooked on everything. Yeah. So, so I think that there's this like a, almost an amorphous view of society shifting. And, and I think what, but from a computational social science point of view, or from our view, if you think about it, I mean, it, it enables us to, to figure out that those people are now different. Where before you didn't really know. Now you will know the person that has got OCD around tracking versus the one that doesn't. Yes. The one that cares about time and the one that doesn't. I mean, it's a fundamental thing that I think can feed recommendation systems. It could feed the things that you're gonna to recommend to somebody. So you're gonna know that if you talk to the person who always wants to be on time, who wants to get things done, who's find out about everything that they do, you know, be precise, be accurate, don't be wrong recommend something that's highly specific to this, that thing that they're interested in. But another person who's more interested in just exploring the whole time, searching for music, don't, you know, doesn't really care about time, you maybe want to explore options with them. Doesn't mean that they at some point want something that's more specific, but you can, but I think you can become much more relevant if you do have the evidence and you can build models around that. So, I mean, I don't know, that's kind of view that, that I think we've- Can I just ask a question just in terms of that? Instead of it being random, don't you think it's more, you know, direction that that they want the world to kind of go there you know if you look at the media social media you know how everything is going they want you to have a less attention span you know in certain things you know and distractions with, with, with your social media thereby kind of you know you forgetting what what's most important about life you know i'm, I'm taking very very <laughs> yeah. social here you know and taking away from yeah, the yeah i know it is um oh, sorry and, and 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 like it's not really random. It's not that okay, th this person's like this or that person's like this. That they're, they're trying to make everyone kind of very uniform, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think that listen, that's a big debate, and it's a pity Peter had to drop off. But you know, the big thing that we've been thinking about is that if if you know that a society has been programmed, because if you think about it, we basically get programmed, you know, from young to believe certain things, like you know, certain fictitious figures, and how we you know live our lives, and 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 what social media has done public social media is that it has allowed individuals or companies to to get to understand the vulnerabilities within a society and then further direct how you then get that particular community to believe what they need to believe and i think that's under real big threat you know and i think that what we should do is have a lot of scrutiny around around like things like you know negative propaganda or mm. if you think of the role of you know, false news or Anything yeah. where you know that the outcome is going to be for singular benefits. But the thing is that most people that are vulnerable cannot identify it. Like, like a kid will not know when they are asked to fill in a puzzle when they go to their social media platform, the fact that puzzle purely is there to track their individual behavior and to find their preferences. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, just my perception of technology, I'm all for technology. You know, I believe it's, you know, that's, yeah one of the things that fund fundamentally make us human but i i just see this you, you know if you look at your silicon valley technocrats and you know they're using technology for more for like personal gain and control rather than 
for the betterment of of humanity and, and society. I think that's <laughs> just something to mention there in terms of let's say uh, you, uh, industry, let's say creates a business model and then YouTube decides that their KPI, their performance is the amount of time people spend watching their videos. And then basically the whole company structures everything around getting as much view time as possible because I don't think it's entirely wrong, but it's probably not like specific enough. But then basically it goes like an AI that's been that's just wrong. And then and because they don't really change a lot once the company is established, they'll just kind of continue on that path. And then no one will change and everybody will just say, We're getting viewing time, we're doing and everybody just agrees with that. So, and well, it's, it's also I think there is a flip side to that, and I can maybe give you a kind of a pet example. If I think about, you know, I'm the, so I'm the guy that never ever turns off his alerts and his recommendations ever, because I absolutely find it intriguing how, how they do what they do. And you know, you can quickly identify the ones that know nothing about you. It's a little like when you, I don't know if anybody has received like a text from their favorite bank lately that said, or a message or an email that said, dear valued customer. <laughs> and then immediately you no, know, it's not, oh, dear. it's not personal. Uh, that means it's nothing now. Yeah. No, they know nothing about you. They actually, yeah. I mean, there's nothing that they even understand about you. And then the flip side is that you just searched on say, you know, Google, you know, for your trip you want to take to the Bahamas. And then what you do is you go to, you know, you go to Facebook and it's filled with adverts of the Bahamas <laughs> and you never and you think, well, oh, this Brother. is a bit creepy. So now so now things are kind of sit between the two. So I kind of figured that if I had to pick the platforms that I like, and this is take, I mean, one that I'm quite fond of is like my music platform. I know that I like highly diverse music and in genres that are not mainstream. So if you look at like like chill up is one of the genres. Mm. Last year when I did the analysis, I, I listened to 4,800 artists last year. I think this year I already sit on 4,800 artists. So that means that there are 4,800 people by which I know I don't know who they are because that means if you ask me what is your favorite artist, I can't tell you anymore. Now the concept is, what is your favorite rhythm? Your favorite beat? What is your favorite subgenre? What is your favorite mashup? It, it's changed entirely because the recommendation engine that sits in Spotify tracks the fact that I like a certain rhythm, not the fact that I like a certain artist or a certain musician. I like a certain style of music and it will find whatever it can find in that style. That means that it's turned music into a transaction. The transaction that is extracted is the value over time. So it knows that if the beat travels at this time, and it's got this, then means this person can be recommended this particular. So I would not be able to live without it. That's like that movie that, come on, that movie that came out, what was it called? 128 kilobits or something. And that thing, and he says, you've got to find the rhythm that goes to the heartbeat. <laughs> now, Rastafarian music. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> no, I'm sorry, I was late, by the way. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was looking forward to this one. So much. No, no, listen, it, it, looks, it looks like you kind of also the guy that might have been when you were younger, you know, go to the record store and then you were only allowed to listen to like five records because you weren't allowed to hug the, hug the you know, the, the turntable or the, CB, the, the CD bay. And you had to go there and go pick which album I'm going to listen to this time. And you go pick one or two, you go stand with it, you listen to it, you say, yes, I'll have this one. And you could only listen to a few songs and they kick you out. You know, and that was it. I mean, that was the extent of your recommendation. No, you couldn't take enough records home from the record library to take them quickly and then bring them back. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry I missed this. I was so keen on this. It, somebody mentioned something earlier about time and how you can put stuff into a, almost like a time stamp. I don't like that. I don't like putting stuff. And then we drifted into the, the whole thing about, you know, tracking it on the watch. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. I was enjoying the flow of the conversation, but I don't like it when you put a time stamp on something. Take mm -hmm. your time and time is suited for the situation. Um, yeah, yes, you said you're late. You're allowed to be late to your family's <laughs> events. If they can't understand that, then, you know, hose them down or do something. But you're allowed to be late for a family event. Uh, just remember the time sites for the data, please. Hey? Yeah, so this is what I was going to say. Now, that timestamp is not necessarily for you. We're not necessarily talking about this timestamp that's necessary for the human, but rather for the system. 
Because yeah. if that system doesn't have that timestamp, that's when it gets these things so wrong. I mean, the value truly comes from this system knowing whether you like to spend time doing something or whether you like to just get in and get something done because you value your, I don't know, self-time more than you would exploring something. But for example, if you like to spend time listening to music, they'll offer you something that'll keep you there for longer. But if you'd rather spend a very short amount of time listening to one or two songs just so that you have something to talk about, well, you know, that should be noted as well. And it should only ever be offered to you on, on certain or at Mine's certain based on my mood. Day. Uh, it is. Mine's based on how I feel, the then, the there and the now. You can ask my whole clan at home here. I always believe in take your time because when you rush, you make such a mistake and you can't take that back. So I'm a believer in take your time and everything. Uh, but I don't want to ask Brian Tar that because he'll have me over a barrel. No, so, take your time. So something I heard was like like one of the Caesars, make haste slowly. So what they mean is like yeah, you try and go in a hurry, but you don't rush things recklessly. Something like Amen. That. I, think the other days, I don't know if anybody has read the, the slow pace of fast change and what happens or it's a fast pace of slow change. So what happens is that when you're in the moment, your perception of change is, is not really, you know, that great. You don't really get an understanding of unless there's, a, is, there's an outage, like you on a computer and it fails. So you can't like look at a tree and watch the thing grow directly. So you have to wait for periods of time. Oh, excuse me, for periods of time to go by. So, so, so the fast pace of slow change really is to try and understand, you know, how many things are going through slow change and how many things can mm. you observe over time. Mm. And I think mm. that, I mean, yeah, for us, the big thing is just that can we collect enough data points, you know, a little bit, you know, Peter, to your point is that can we collect enough data points that we can figure out your emotional state if we're going to recommend something to you? And if we don't know oh, your... Oh, no, you need a lot of time for that to work and if we, no, but, but, just, but just hear me out for a moment. And if we don't <laughs> know your emotional state, how do we run a test to figure out what your emotional state could yeah. be under certain conditions? So what we yeah. do is we make you really upset. We then observe your behavior once you are upset and then if we then fix what made you upset, we then measure the endorphins that are flowing that makes you really happy. So that means we'll be able to know the distance of the happiness and the sadness effect. And then all we need to do is oscillate you between those two things. Because remember that true happiness is only present if you've got true sadness. So we can, so you'll be able to program that, isn't it? Oh, I like that. Say that again, just to expand on that. <laughs> I, 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 the reference to that just now, actually, while I was listening to Jay, it kind of seems like something, I'm not sure who has kids or, or I've got much, much younger siblings. And it's like kids do that often with their parents as well. They'll find out exactly what that gauge is. So they'll find a way, or at least I don't know if all kids are like this. I know I was like this. I'd find a way to make my parents really angry just so that I could see what the gauge of that extent was. <laughs> what the boundaries of that was so that you can see just how far you can push it within that space. And the machine would work somewhat in a similar way. So it would just be testing those waters, but not necessarily trying to get you to do something that you're not or trying to get you to act in a way that you don't want to by forcing you to do something. It rather goes, okay, cool. So let's just ping, ping, and then see what that outline is of you that eventually comes forward and then goes, okay, cool. So this is a definite yes, that's a definite no. This is the boundary within that space that you can play. So just in terms of what you can do if you want to track like emotions is you just get EEGs for all the employees. <laughs> and then you can also get a shock thing. So they're, they're like, they're like, like a emotions, then you just shock them. Him, and then you can train like, them to, like, yeah. and you can also track their productivity and all that stuff yeah man i'm actually disappointed about missing the clock because i'm fascinated by time on on how things i mean it's like my hair is growing it's taking its time i'm trying to get it faster you know everything for me is about time it's about even when i travel somewhere i want to know the times but i can't put stuff in the put time stamps on things I so it's not start and finish. See, have you seen this? The Janus point. Oh, let me Google that quickly. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a new theory of time. It's trying to extrapolate alternative views around how we measure time in multiple 
planes and how we bring different constructs of time. Yeah, well, we live in a country that time, what's it? It's time is, uh, no, distance country, is measured in time. Which country? South Africa. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, how long will it take? I mean, how far is it from here to Durbanville? Ugh, about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything is 20 minutes away. <laughs> now, Peter, what you were saying there just now is you, you want things to obviously arrive on time. You need to know what time the plane arrives or what time this thing needs to happen, what time that thing needs to happen. I mean, isn't and but you don't know how to organize it yourself. I mean, isn't this how technology is extremely helpful in this sense? I mean, if you've got things that ping a certain time frame before something else happens, well, then you can know, OK, cool. So I'll get this email at this point and I'll get this at this point and I'll get that. It means that you can save space for your own other mm. enjoyments rather mm. than having to keep time if you're not necessarily good at it. Well, I wouldn't care when a plane arrives if I wasn't going to fetch the person. If the person was coming here by themselves, then I don't care what the plane lands because yeah. then they just ring the doorbell. But it's when I have to, it's when it involves me that I need to collect somebody and then it's a fixed route and, and, and everything. And then that's where you have to conform with time to fit in. The plane needs to take over. I got you, but if it didn't involve my life, just knock on the door. <laughs> I'll open it. If I'm here, yes. If I'm not, <laughs> Sorry, next time. Can I, can I just ask a question? Just like in terms of your opinion on like, you know, the, the schools of thought of, of different dimensions, multiple dimensions, like, you know, they say that we live in this completely 3D dimension and there's a huge focus on the physical world. Whereas, you know, some people say there's so many different dimensions, like up to nine different dimensions, you know, and then they break it down into humans not being actually physical, I mean, more just vibrations and frequencies. And, you know, our thoughts are also just vibrations and frequencies that, that just vibrate at a, must, a much faster you know, frequency or whatever is a rock or you know something more solid like at, at a lower frequency so what, what is your opinion on on kind of getting studies into understanding those dimensions and, and where would you even start would you start at physics would you start at biology or is it a case of we're looking at science too isolated rather than you know holistically france maybe you want to tackle this one yeah, okay, I'll, I'll have a go at this one. I'll actually just say what I've been thinking for a little while, but I'll try to mangle my thoughts into a way so it sounds more or less like a response to the question. So, okay, so, so like where I would start with, with thinking about time and theorizing about time, if it was going to be a philosophical, mind you, I would just start the same place no matter what sort of I was doing. I would try to think what role does notions of time, and like you guys did a fairly good job of um, explaining that there are different notions of time and like quite profoundly different or significantly different notions of time. But then what role do those notions of time play in us trying to live better lives and to create value? And so one of the things I've been thinking about is that having shared measures of time help us to coordinate activities and that help us to engage in processes where sequential order is important for the value of the outcome. So if you, uh, follow a baking recipe, sticking everything in the oven first, and then trying to mix the ingredients isn't going to work. And likewise, when people coordinate on work, sometimes the temporal order of who does what when is important. When someone plays a piece of music, if some of the musicians are out of time, the music has less value. So then notions of time that allow us to coordinate more effectively have a place in creating value by helping us to coordinate. And like similarly for other notions, if you have a cyclical notion of time, in certain contexts that helps people organize their lives and think about the world in ways that help them create value. So my starting point wouldn't necessarily be physics. Um, I think physics derives its authority from its proven ability to help us do the things that we value. So when I went to the example of GPS, GPS is something that most people in developed worlds have had a lot of use of and has created a lot of value. And the difference between a, a 20 meter radius accuracy and a one meter radius accuracy uh, can require a clock that's an order of magnitude or two more accurate in order to um, to do the calculations necessary. So, that, so yeah. that's if you get physicists and engi physical engineers, nuclear engineers or whatever to build a really accurate clock, they can use that to synchronize devices. And I, I don't know how much- What about- accurate measurement of time actually helps in asynchronous computing or computing over the net or so. I'm sure it has a bunch of applications there. So, uh, so, what so about, 
Yeah, I just want to quickly mention that it's like standardization, like making shipping containers the same size all over the world. It makes it easier to plan. Yes. Can, can I just add quickly, just as, a side, so, as, as, a, as an aside, the only reason why time became codified was for navigation. Before, when you didn't need to navigate, you didn't need time because, like Francois was saying, it, 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 it time helped navigation. Then before that, they didn't need time because it was Daniel was saying. Yeah, I also think that navigation had a big impact. But let's just think about the question, original question, just for a moment, and that is that if we say that we've been looking at it in kind of three-dimensional space, we've got a time, place, and act. Those are the vectors that we track through all most of our algorithms, right? So that means that at a point in time, at a certain location, you perform a certain act. That act could be booking something, buying something, doing something. But now, what is the what are the other dimensions that are present? Because I think that, and, and this is really, if I understand the question correctly, is that if we had to, if if we had you know a certain kind of so let, let, let's say we had a dimension called aura, right? <laughs> And I don't know anything about Aura, but I'm just because I know that I've got a friend in California who used to talk about this. He had a great case study around how this used to work. But if we had another dimension called Aura, so time, place, and act in Aura, and I can find a, a, a reliable instrument that can measure Aura. So I can build an instrument that can look at you, pick up the colors around your head and whatever, and I add that as a dimension. What would that mean for my accuracy? And what if there are other dimensions that we have not thought about that needs to be added to the vector set? Is that's what you were asking, isn't it? An aura time measure. Wow. <laughs> that yeah. would change. I, I think I think the notion the notion oh, of dimension oh, so is maybe me? sorry, Joe, were you asking me? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, I guess, yes. I mean, I mean that that's a very interesting thought. I mean, putting aura into it, I mean that's yeah. not <laughs> something that I would have thought about, but yeah, I guess, yeah. How would you measure something like this, you know? Well, you see, that's the thing. So that's what, what we've been looking at is we're saying that if we stick with our three vector system for now. It's like, it's like trying to measure, measure someone's fit. <laughs> yeah, you can bundle things into act. So if, so if you want to know, you know, something about a person's, like, let's, let's think about the concept of lifestyle, right? So style normally means that it's a kind of a collective of activities that are performed in a certain way that might be done repeatedly the same in a kind of the same manner. So that means that if you know that somebody every Sunday, you know, buys food at the restaurant next to the church, you know, you can't make an assumption that they do go to that church, but you can then eventually see, but hang on, they give a donation. So you can kind of, you know, almost extrapolate something about their existence because you know that this is what they're doing. But if you have other people who just never perform certain actions, never go to certain places, you know, you and you have enough evidence. It means that you can extract other dimensions of understanding. I think you're 100% right. I mean, look, I think a lot of that actually happens now. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys know, but you know, Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go was built by 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 Google Maps. Exactly. On top of on top of Ingress. So they created Ingress first to capture portals, and then they built Pokemon Go on top of that. To, yes. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. So I mean, so 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 I mean, they kind of used it to predict and and kind of see how they could, you know, I, I think they call it feed through the door. You know, and then yes. all these large corporations like McDonald's and whatever were yeah. paying, you know, Pokemon Go, or whatever, to get people to come to the shops. It's like the whole or the clicks to, to clicks to buy, but you know, more feet into the door. So, Have you looked at Ingress at all? Go check it out. So, yeah. so what Google Earth did, there were 15 or so guys sitting in San Francisco. I mean, a city. They weren't in the main campus, and they were really agonizing over how they're going to turn Google Earth into a money-making business because it wasn't really earning the revenue dollars that it was supposed to get from providing people through guidance, you know, like pop-ups and so on, like you had with Waze or companies like those that used to give adverts inside the app. So what they did was they said, well, why don't we create a game to go and capture all of the world's like sacred places, like statues or, you know, just interesting things and let the society tag those for us. Mm -hmm. So they designed this game called Ingress, and was really go have a look at it. It's fascinating. Yeah. I, mean, I, I still play it every now and then. My my one of my younger daughters just this weekend again captured a few portals, you know, in this region where we live. But what, what they basically did was they created the resistance and the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So there are two movements, and you have to pick one of those when you join the Ingress community. Then what you then do is that that in a certain suburb, say let's say the resistance will go and capture all of the valuable portals. So it could be 
you know, somebody did a great painting on a, on a wall somewhere, or there's a house that looks really interesting, whatever it is, and you can go tag it. And then the Enlightenment has to go and capture it mm. and take it away from them. And the more, you know, tokens that you capture, the more digital assets you build up. Now, Google essentially captured the world like that. So when they then built Pokemon Go on top of that platform, they then said, well, if we're now going to drive a new way of getting hyper-local advertising working, and you want to get foot traffic in, say, you know, downtown New York or in you know, a city like maybe San Francisco, Chicago or London or pl places where you have a lot of people on foot, why don't we just get them to go to a brand? So Nike was one of the very first very big clients. So they mm -hmm. used to get people to those stores and make sure that they get there fast. Because if they get there quick enough and they capture it, they could get a special on a pair of running shoes. But you could only get there by running there. <laughs> and it's, yeah, listen, it's a fascinating, um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been following them for the last few years as well. And it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, and it always fascinates me how you do that, because I mean, to get a special on running shoes, it needs to be 90%. Otherwise, it's not special. I don't want 10%. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> just, but Peter, that's, I think that's, you know, that, that's how we maybe think about it. But if you look at their revenue, go look at the, go look at the annual report from how long ago was it now? Six years or so ago when they launched it. They did $400 million in gross profit. That first, I think it was a quarter or after they launched that product. The big Sorry. brands just jumped onto yeah. it. It's a, it's a bit like what happened with companies like Pinterest and so on, where you can do embedded and immersive advertising without people knowing that they're being advertised to. And the well, same getting back to your, your thing that you said about aura color, right now you're making me feel rather blue. <laughs> um, something just in terms of that, if you think about, let's say, a computer game, you can see characters on it, you can see cars driving around, but they're not real characters or real cars. They're written with computer code and then generated mm -hmm. on the screen. So yeah. we also see using light, so we don't really know fundamentally how everything... No, of course. But I think, but this is get back to the Ingress story. So what happens with Ingress compared to Pokemon Go, in a Pokemon, they, because they made it safe for kids, they lowered the age, meant that they had a whole different set of rules. So that means that that they created a reality, you know, for the kid to play in without being influenced by anybody around them. Ingress, you have to be 18 or older. So you sign in and there are global communities. I mean, the last one I attended was in LA. And there must have been a thousand people in some massive hall sharing ideas as to how to hack portals. And you know, and you can see everybody else on the Ingress game in your suburb, but you don't know who they are. They all got personas. And you can see who's chasing which, you know, token or which, you know, portal they want to go and hack. It's really worth looking at it because I think that what it showed is that this time spatial dimension from a tooling point of view, you know, people are spending a fair amount of time taking it out of the mechanical use, like to say Google Earth. And to make sense of how humans really move, game them and let them participate. And then keep on gaming and to see if you can make more sense of it. So, yeah, because we normally don't understand. Yeah. Really, no. And I can see you can cheat on it because it's no good if you can't move. Let's say you, if you're limited motion wise, see, so you can do spoofing <laughs> to yes. say where you are. In case, like, uh, just on that point, I mean, ga gamification is quite huge. I mean, for the people that live in South Africa, discovery and, and you know, the, the way they look at, you know, people's habits and basically control the way you should live your life to for them to save again on money, you know, like the whole driving concept. Yeah. Know. So do you they like measure that? how you drive. <laughs> so they make sure you drive a certain way. And if you drive well, slow and boring or whatever, cause less accidents, which is less claims. You know, so, so <laughs> that's not me. Here's the question. Do you like that? Are you in favor or against uh, no, no. I, I, I don't like that. I'm against it. No. <laughs> no. So in the, in, the, in the gym tracking, do you are you okay with somebody tracking you to go to gym and running and tracking? No, because it tells me to hurry up because I'm resting. I have to drop off people. I just want to say thank you. Jess, I'd really like an, another invite to another session. Guys and ladies and gentlemen, sorry, I've got to be pronoun specific. I do apologize for being late. I have to go because I've got a big deal brewing, but big love and yeah, take it easy and thank you. Uh, ever so much. Cool. Cheers, Peter. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yes. Yeah, so, so I mean, I personally don't like it. I mean, I, I don't want to be paying extra premium because I drive a little bit faster today or, or you know, or I didn't go to the gym or whatever. Yeah. It's just, I feel like it's, you're being more controlled. And I think a lot of people don't really realize that. Yeah, I think it's a choice that you make, isn't it? You have to decide if you're going to trade your behavior for money, mm. then you have to decide how you participate. And it's a bit like when you go to Google, and you go read the li Google's license agreement, it's pretty clear. It says that 
you trade all of your behavior on our platform in return for access to the search engine. The problem is that people don't see it like that because it's all behind the covers. Because but if you, next time if you do this, go to the bottom and it says about us. And yeah. there's a thing called an EUL, an end user license agreement. And you go read what it says, because it says that if you click on the buttons on this page, because there are only two buttons on the front of Google, you know, search and I feel lucky. And depending on how you click on those, you sign a contract every time you do that. They record it as a contract. Wow. And that means you sign that contract that you will part with whatever you do with them belongs to them now. Mm, so that yeah. means that but people don't see it like that. You know, yeah. and in the digital world, we're very aware of that, the whole side. Yeah. In terms of that, let's say, for example, uh, Microsoft, when you create like a new tab, it opens the news and it catches your attention. And, you, and I guess what you, okay, in terms of that, the companies have a kind of control. Like you've only got that many browsers that's currently working and they're all copying each other in terms of how they kind of operate. And then everybody kind of has to follow those rules. So, I mean, you can't go in, yeah, there's not a lot of other options besides discovery, and it's also economies of scale and stuff like that. So it's like complicated. And they also kind of, I can't send Google like a document telling them, here's my terms of uh, as a customer that they uh, are accepting. Yeah, because the way they made, the way they describe it in the contract is pretty clear. It says that if you don't like what we offer you, leave. Mm -hmm. So that means that, I mean, I'm a big fan of when I do generic research and I want to get answers that are not kind of locked to a geography or a city, then you just use a Tor browser with DuckDuckGo. You know, that means that there are other means by which you can gain access to the world's data without having to go through the big platforms because they are all paid for. It's lock, mm -hmm. stock, and barrel. So if you go to, you know, if you open up Edge from Microsoft and it opens up Bing, you can't even change the default browser anymore. They stopped that now. They got, remember, they got a, law, a court order that they won now to say that they don't have to allow people to do it. So that means it brings up the news, whatever it is, and it knows everything, unless you run other means by which you can dis disconnect. I mean, for me, it's still the most fascinating one ever. Is if you had to go to Microsoft Teams agreement, you will see that this agreement says that they are allowed to track this content while we're speaking in order to sell us better product. And you sign it when you use Microsoft. And they have convinced suckers like all of us to use this platform. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> they are allowed. Go check it. Go check out the privacy agreement. You can just go on Microsoft Teams that you are now. Go to help about it and then go check what they are allowed to track. <laughs> Everything. It's a good thing we want to oh, what you do, how long you've been there. Sorry, Jess. I said it's a good thing we want as many people as possible to know what we're talking about. So. <laughs> but Jay, doesn't that mean like that strength of weak ties or something to that effect? I mean, Microsoft probably went to the biggest company. They probably went to Walmart first. And they said, we'll give it to you for free. And then everybody that wants to interact with Walmart has to get it. And then everybody else that interacts with those people have to get it. And then, yes. Yeah, no, remember that's the, I mean, the, it's not that it was done. I mean, it wasn't Sachan's doing it. I think it was a previous leadership there that kind of forced that. But, but the whole thing around, if you, if you capture an enterprise from the inside out, you can force everybody around him to participate. So, yeah, I mean, that is uh, consequence. The IT industry or technology industry isn't regulated yet. So I guess in terms of when you get a lawyer, they can't force you to say, I can use your money or funds how I like and I'll pay it back to you when I've got the chance and so forth. So eventually, yeah, yeah maybe regulation caused that. Caused yeah, and that's it. an ongoing debate. How much of technology should be regulated or not? That's really, that's probably for an entire series on its own. <laughs> Listen, Jess, I'm going to have to drop off, unfortunately. I, I was about to call an end to the conversation anyway, because it's been two hours. Okay. We're just under two hours. It's been fascinating. Thanks, uh, Jess, Daniel, Jay, and, and the participants, some you guys. Nice to meet you, Sanka. And we will be um, continuing this uh, series next week. And then the following week, we're at AI Expo. So, yeah, join us again next week for another exciting installment. Cheers, everyone.